Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm quite happy to talk uh, this morning, indeed, about GMesh. Um, let me just, yeah, briefly tell you who I am. So I'm not per se in acoustics. So I'm a professor at the University of Liège. I don't know. Should I remove this, maybe, or is my okay? Do, do you see? Okay. 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 Cool. All right. So I'm a professor at the University of Liège, as Jonathan. Jonathan sa said, so I lead a team of about yeah, 15 people in what we call the Montefiore Institute. And in my group, we have applied mathematicians, um, computer scientists, and then engineers. We basically do, yep, ah, I cannot go, oh, here we go. We basically do modeling analysis and algorithm development. And we apply this in a wide variety of settings. Uh, currently, we have three main topics that we are working on, so electromagnetics, geophysics and biomedical problems and as Jonathan said we produce quite a bit of software and so I will talk to you about GMesh. Some of you might have used it in the past or currently are using it so it's an open source finite element mesh generator um, and it has the aim of providing let's say a whole pipeline to do let's say geometrical creation or modification meshing solver interfacing and then post-processing it has a GUI, so a graphical user interface, and you can drive your own solver, let's say, through this thing that we call OneLab, which is a, an interface to solvers. So the focus of the workshop today is more about software and the tooling and the way we deal with, let's say, uh, software projects. And so let me give you some numbers first. So GMesh is not a huge code. It, it's not small either, but it's, let's say, mid-size, I would say. So it's like half a million lines of C++, which makes it, I guess, some kind of a, a mid-size kind of software project. Um, it's still manageable to, let's say, understand all of it uh, for the two core developers, which are Jean-François Remacle at uh, Université Catholique de Louvain, also in Belgium, and myself. And in the kernel, pretty much these two guys develop and maintain everything, so Jean-François and myself, but then we have quite a few contributors for what I could call maybe peripherals or let's say additional modules or contributions that are not really impacting the kernel, but that augment the, the, the features of the, of the software. There are some mailing lists. You see some numbers over there. Uh, the code is open source, so it gets downloaded quite a bit, um, mostly on Windows actually, so binaries for, for Windows. Um, as Jonathan th said, actually, it's uh, a nice way to get recognized for practical, let's say, research activities. So it gets cited quite a bit. Uh, the GMesh paper, last time I looked at it, is cited yeah, more than 4,000 times. And it's a bit hard to, to, to know for sure, but from, let's say, uh, anecdotal feedback that uh, we get uh, at conferences and in industry, GMesh has probably become one of the, let's say, most popular open source uh, finite element uh, mesh generating tools. So instead of showing you the code, let me show you what it looks like to have, let's say, 20 years of development uh, in one minute. So it's 20 years, uh, a bit more than that. So the video that you're looking at here basically starts in 2001 bef because before that we actually didn't use uh, a revision uh, revisioning system. And so what you see here is basically the development starting in 2001 uh, tracked with CVS and then the switch to subversion and then the last few years uh, using Git. And this interesting thing that you can see, you see like three big kind of uh, uh, chunks, let's say here. So every dot, right, every color dot is a file. And in the middle here, so the middle, let's say, chunk here is like the kernel. And the color of each dot uh, is linked to the, let's say, the, the activity on the file. So if it's red or very bright, it means that it's been changed recently. And then you see the middle of the kernel, so it gets small changes all the time. Let me maybe pause this, or let's, yeah, let's look at it over here. So you see the kernel over here with many things that are updated quite a bit, but by few people uh, in red. Then you have the bottom, uh, kind of uh, aggregation here, which are the tests. And so these are green because they don't change. So some new tests are added, but we want all tests to still run. And this for uh, 20 year plus. And the right part, which is extremely active, is actually the contribution. 
let's say, part of GMesh. So that's the thing that is not in the kernel and that is developed by either our PhD students or postdocs or let's say all the external corroborators that, uh, that we have. All right, and so this is a bit of history about GMesh. So we started in 96 and it's important to notice that actually it was a side project. So um, both Jean-François and myself were PhD students at the time and uh, Jean-François was finish finishing and I was starting my PhD and our PhD was not at all on, on mesh generation. Uh, my PhD was about mixed finite element methods for Maxwell and um, we had a single license seat for IDs at the time. And so if you wanted a mesh in 3D of a complicated structure, actually you had to reserve a seat to get access to the, to the CAD system. And so at the time being young and probably, well, I don't know, not as word savvy as I am now, I thought, oh, how hard could it be? And so let's just write our own, you know, little CAD kernel and mesh generator. So we thought it was a good idea. Of course, we're still at it 25 years later. But okay, so that's, the how, that's how it was started as a side project. So we were working on the PhD during the day and developing GMesh at night pretty much. And so you see some dates over here. Pretty soon we made the uh, first release, it was in 98. It was binary only at the time. Um, and then over the years you see here, so I was in the US and so we open source the code under the GNU license. And we got really serious about GMesh in 2006. Um, due to a rewrite that we did in 2004, 2005, um, while I was considering maybe coming back to Europe. And so we rewrote basically the whole thing and it led to what you know now. So it was GMesh 2 first and then GMesh 3 with uh, Boolean operations. And then two years ago, GMesh 4 with the new API work. And so 2020, we basically now start publishing, uh, let's say, um, software that is based on GMesh to do calculations. And so there is a new GMesh FEM solver for efficient high order finite element methods that has just been released. So before going to the, the software really aspects, I thought it would be good to show you a little bit about what GMesh is in a few slides. And so there are four modules in GMesh, geometry, meshing, solver and post-processing. And one of the particular things about GMesh is that you can use it at three levels. So either as a, a beginner, let's say through the GUI, so the graphical user interface, you can use it through the original Geo language. Um, so we designed this at the time in 96, because at the time Python and all these, let's say, uh, new languages were not available yet, or at least not that popular. So we, well, all the codes pretty much invented, let's say, uh, a domain specific, let's say, language for their codes. And now you can use GMesh as a library, uh, of course, through C++, C Python, or Julia. What, are, what is the main, let's say, defining characteristic about GMesh is that everything is written in terms of abstract entities, as we call them, which means that if you apply an algorithm in GMesh for meshing a surface, actually GMesh doesn't know uh, actually who is uh, representing that surface. It only queries, let's say, an underlying CAD kernel. And so the open source version of GMesh interfaces two CAD kernels, our own small toy built-in CAD kernel and the open source open cascade kernel. And then you can get uh, GMesh versions which are not open source because they cannot be when they are linked with professional CAD kernels. So you can have, for example, GMesh linked with Parasolid. And that way you actually use this exact same algorithm but querying, let's say, the exact representation from your CAD kernel. And this is paramount if you want to do really complicated model with hundreds of thousands of uh, entities, extremely large meshes, billions of elements, then this kind of abstract uh, matter of represent, uh, manner of representation, represent, representing th things for you is, uh, is important. All right, and basically we use that abstraction to be able to either do classical CAD models, so this is a landing gear of an Airbus plane, but you can also do our built-in kernel to do, for example, multi-scale geometries. This is ocean modeling. And more recently, we've been working a lot on uh, exploring, um, let's say, data uh, to represent geometries where you don't have CAD, so not an actual geometry, but you have something discrete and we can manage that. So I will just show you four slides on what's recent for those of you who haven't followed GMesh recently. CSG, I talked already about it, so this, you all know what it is. So you can do solid modeling in GMesh. 
it looks like this. You can have boxes, spheres, you intersect, you do whatever operation you want and you get these kind of results. The second new thing uh, that some of you might not have used yet, it's the API, so an application programming interface. This is how we use GMesh nowadays. It has several goals, most related to the fact that we want it to be simple and easy to maintain. And so this goes into reproducibility. Um, and the way we do it actually is to do things in a very simple way. We are purely functional and we generate, let's say, these APIs directly without using any complicated wrapping strategy. And you can basically do your geometries in Python now, or you can do them in uh, C++. It's pretty much the same kind of interface that you get. The main advantage of doing that, in addition to, let's say, using full-fledged programming languages to access the data, is that you can actually use now the GMesh library to build your own code. And so you have access to the mesh efficiently, to basis functions, Jacobians, you have access to the GUI, and we produce an SDK, so a binary software development kit that you can just download. So you download the library and you can go ahead and code using GMesh. Next new thing is parallel meshing. I'm not going to explain anything, just show you some pictures. So this is the typical performance that you get in 2020 with GMesh. So on a single thread, you can now generate, let's say, 100 million tetrahedra, including surface mesh generation in, you know, 360 seconds. So that's the kind of performance you get. You can go extremely large, so you can generate, you know, 700 million tets in 135 seconds if you have a nice uh, 64 core AMD APIC. And the last new thing, as I said, we were, we are interested in, let's say, geometrical data, which has no uh, underlying CAD and typically stuff that comes from imaging. And so we have now a whole pipeline where you can basically just take an input STL file and it will segment it and you'll get, let's say, a mesh out of it automatically. So these are actual examples that we uh, use this new workflow for. This is a, an, an image from an X-ray tomography. And you see that it's an extremely complicated geometry, topologically very complicated, and you can just remesh it basically in one click. So what are the choices that we made in GMesh that might be of interest to you? Well, the main strategy that we followed from the get-go due to, let's say, the, the way that GMesh was conceived at the beginning is that we wanted something fast, light, and user-friendly because we, the only other tools that we had access to at the time were, were quite slow, really heavy, and, well, not really user-friendly because you actually have, as I said, make a reservation for this seat. And so it's written in C++. Uh, there are several GUIs, so the one that uh, you are most familiar with, if you use GMesh, is based on Fultic. Uh, there is also a port to iOS and Android. We use OpenGL for graphics. It's highly portable, so GMesh has compiled and available on pretty much anything that exists, even on uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, you can easily install it, and we spent a lot of work, actually, in making GMesh, which is quite a complicated software tool to install, so in such a way that you don't have dependencies when you install it. We, as an open source project, interface with many third-party libraries, and so we use CMake to, 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 to handle that. And some of these libraries, which are a bit exotic, we actually redistribute them directly in this gmesh slash contrib uh, code uh, path. As I said, it was a hobby until 2006, and then we got quite a bit of funding to continue development both from industry and then from the, the usual, let's say, suspects in Belgium, it's Wallonia or the Belgian federal government, and then the European Commission as well. The choices that we made for the community infrastructure are not typical, and I will just tell you in a few minutes why. So we use our own infrastructure. We have always done that. Um, currently, we use GitLab. And one of the main reasons is that we want to be able to maintain public and private parts. We do continuous integration and delivery, both of the application and then of the SDK, so this library. We have mailing lists, of course, a website, and then indeed we, we write papers about the algorithms in, in journals. We license it under the GPL version two or later. We also add exceptions so that we can easier link with external libraries. And we do, since there are some parts of GMesh that we cannot make open source, I talked about for example, proprietary cat kernels. So we need to be able to double license. 
So to enable, let's say, embedding these kind of GMesh versions in, in, in commercial code. What are some of the lessons that we have learned? Well, foremost, I would say that having an easy to install binary is actually crucial. At the beginning, we thought it would just be for non-experts, but actually over the years, we, thought, we saw that even for many experts, and even Linux and even HPC clusters, actually having a binary, a reference, let's say, code that you can run as is, without recompiling everything is actually crucial. The second thing is that if you want that, actually continuous integration and delivery is extremely variable. So we used to do nightly builds and let's say with, uh, let's say hand build tooling that would generate all these builds. Now we use GitLab for everything. It works extremely nicely. On Linux, it's really beautiful. So it uses Docker for everything. So it's completely reproducible. It's very easy to, to actually upgrade and maintain. It's not as nice on Windows and Mac OS for now, so we still use virtual machines for that. So if you have, let's say, questions about it, I can point you to where we actually keep all the information so they can see the way that we manage this, let's say, uh, CI, CD. There is a, the usual paradox when you develop, develop software. So your users, they always want new features, but they actually don't want any change in the code because they want to keep you know, their input uh, data files and their workflows exactly the same. And so you really want to maintain backward compatibility. We try really hard. Uh, it's really important, but it's really hard. And so when, for example, we uh, integrated new CAD kernels, well, it was one of the main, let's say, headaches to actually manage to still run files from 20 years ago with the new thing while all the code basically was changed in between. And in order to achieve that, actually keeping the code as simple as possible uh, helps a lot. And as I said before, there are few external contributions at the kernel level, but there are a lot in these peripherals or, the, or these contributed, let's say, parts of the software. And so keeping a, a clear separation between, let's say, these two parts of the code is actually uh, extremely useful. All right, so I think I'm right on time. And so, Thank you, everybody.